Chapter 4 Elena was like the weather vane on top of Senor Mendoza's house. She picked up on every change in the wind, no matter how slight. The day after my birthday, she seemed more alert than ever. She followed me everywhere I went, a silent little shadow. I ignored her. I did not talk to her or look her in the eye. I tried to hide it, but she sensed my excitement about Papa's note. I had to tell Elena about my trip across La Lina. I could not put it off any longer. The sooner she knew the truth, the sooner she could get used to the idea. Late Friday afternoon, I dug out my last few pesos. I had to take Elena to San Jacinto. I would buy her mango ice cream, her favorite, and tell her in public. Maybe she would behave if we were around other people. Let's go to town, Elena, I said. We will get some ice cream and hang out. She squinted her eyes and frowned slightly. I never asked her to have fun with me. She did not trust my invitation. Okay. She was too glad to go to refuse my offer. On the edge of San Jacinto, Elena stopped. She pulled up her special pink t-shirt, the one Mama sent from California, so her belly button showed for the whole world to see. You look trashy. Cover up. I reached over with both hands and jerked her t-shirt back down. Mensa, así deshonras nuestro nombre. Elena backed up and tugged at her jeans. They moved lower on her hips. She hooked her thumbs in her belt loops and stuck her chin out defiantly. To no eres nadie para juzgar, she said. Who are you to judge? I looked her up and down. My sister was pretty. She really did not need to show skin for boys to notice her. I could scold her about dishonoring the family, but I was not her parent, and she knew it. She was not about to let me tell her how she could dress. Elena reached deep into the pocket of her jeans and pulled out an envelope. She had chewed each fingernail off, way down, a sure sign she was worried about something. Her slender fingers fumbled with the letter. Abuelita got this the other day, she confessed. It is from Mama. I am sorry I didn't show it to you before. Don't be mad at me. I grabbed the paper roughly, jerking it out of Elena's grasp. It was Mama's usual letter, full of news. There was even a new photo of the twin sisters we had never seen. Three-year-old Maria and Liliana. They sat almost as if they were one, hands clasped, their lips turned up in identical grins, deep dimples on each cheek. Their noses crinkled up the same way and their faces were framed by curly black hair. I held the picture by one corner and stared. How was it possible to have sisters I had never even seen? Did you read the last paragraph, Miguel? Elena asked nervously. Do you think Mama means it? Do you think we will go soon? I read it aloud, Elena mouthing each word with me. We've all been working hard, overtime. We almost have enough money for you, Elena. It will not be long, te prometo. Please take good care of Abuelita. You're all she has now. Elena was ignoring the truth of Mama's words. I gave her an exasperated look. She knew the way it worked. She knew Papa's plan. Papa went first. Mama followed. I was next. Elena would be last. Papa sent for us one by one, waiting until he had money in hand. Come on, Elena. I steered her toward the plaza. Elena got mango and I got chocolate and we sat side by side on one of the splintered benches at the edge of the La Plaza. Two senors, the ancient Dominguez Cuates, sat on the far side, string bags at their feet. 
<clears throat> they folded their arms and gossiped in small voices, their chins on their chests. El alcalde, Don Ramiro, Ramiro sat dozing in a chair, and two men played a slow game of checkers under the tree. Three little boys kicked a soccer ball into and out of the empty wading pool at the edge of the plaza. The blue concrete was cracked and stained with rust from the drain. This place is dead, Elena said, licking her cone. She gestured at me, then La Plaza, and then beyond, to include the whole town. Thanks a lot, I said. E.K.? You know what I mean. She looked out at the deserted town. There should have been lots of people out that time of day. She was right. San Jacinto had been emptied of young men. A few left because they wanted to. Most left because they had to. There was no work. Nothing work worth doing. Just odd jobs here and there that paid a few pesos. Not enough to feed a family. Who would want to stay anymore? Elena continued. Even the girls are leaving now if they can. Just last month, Jesusita left with that new boyfriend of hers. She's 16, Elena. I made 16 sound like 60. Old, really old. Tu que sabes, you're barely 15, Miguel. You're hardly old, even older than me, Elena said angrily. It was the biggest insult she could think of. It was also how she saw the world. In her mind, the 18 months that separated us were nothing. If I was old enough to do something, then she was too. She stood up and threw the last third of her ice cream cone on the dried up grass beneath my feet. That was Elena's way of telling me she knew I would be going. It was, her, it was her way of telling me what a chicken I was for keeping it a secret. It's not fair, Miguel. It is not fair. Elena turned and started running down Avenida Principal, out of town. She went right down the center of the road. There weren't any cars to worry about or boys to impress. So she ran fast, kicking up the red dirt. It mixed with the sweat running down her face ruining her pretty pink shirt. Chapter five. By Sunday noon, everyone knew Don Clemente had returned from La Capital. You couldn't miss his new black Mercedes among the 30-year-old beat up, patched together VW Beetles and Chevy Novas. Most of us did not have cars at all. I walked to Don Clemente's compound it was no longer a house. He had added two stories, a fancy tiled courtyard, a three car garage, gates all around and a security system. They said there was even a swimming pool inside. Don Clemente made his money off people like us who needed him. Juanito stood at Don Clemente's front gate. He slouched against the wrought iron his hands stuck in his pockets. Juanito was Don Clemente's bueno para nada nephew, spoiled by money and too much time on his hands. He screened his uncle's visitors. I had hated him ever since we had both tried out for goalie on the best regional soccer team. It had been my last shot to make it and Juanito had beat me out. Everyone believed Don Clemente had bribed the coach. Then Juanito had squandered his chance by drinking and partying and missing practice. Within two months, he had been kicked off the team. Juanito was a jerk, yet I envied him even more than I hated him. Sometimes they felt like the same thing, hate and envy. I was jealous of Juanito's easy money. I hated him for his freedom to do what he wanted. The worst thing was that Juanito knew how I felt. I could not hide it. He had taken advantage of me if he could. Hey Juanito, I said, esta tu tío? I have to see him. I moved closer, his eyes were red. He covered them quickly with his sunglasses. I smiled to let him know what a loser he was. He's busy, you better come back another day. 
Juanito answered. I was sure this was a lie. It was just Juanito's way of annoying me. I didn't back down. Check for me, I replied. He's expecting me. I sat down on a carved bench flanked by planters overflowing with bright pink bougainvillea flowers. And then I pulled out a newspaper and read the soccer scores. I was not going anywhere until I saw Don Clemente. Juanito sighed, punched code into the gate, and retreated into the house. I waited an hour. When Juanito finally returned, he led me through the cool courtyard and around the side of the house to the back. Don Clemente sat on a vine-covered patio, his back to me, sipping black coffee. He did not turn to greet me. He just motioned with his good right hand to come and sit across from him. With the bad left hand, he dismissed Juanito. Don Clemente turned his one good eye towards me. He did not try to hide the dark red burn scars that covered the whole left side of his face. He did not cover up the empty eye socket. He dared me to stare, to be embarrassed for him. I did not look away. Don Clemente respected those who were not afraid to see his ugliness. He leaned down and pulled a packet of papers out of the brief briefcase at his feet. I have heard from Domingo, he announced. To Padre, he added, as if I might have forgotten Papa's name. He sent money and asked me to make arrangements for you to go. Don Clemente pushed the papers across the table to me. Everything you need is there. It's becoming more complicated to make the journey. You must follow the instructions I have provided. Unfortunately, I can no longer vouch for everyone who assists in my operation, he explained. I've had to rely on some polleros whose reputation you should fear. He stopped to let this sink in. I waited for him to finish. But your coyote he continued, pointing to the papers. The one I've arranged for, he's the best. I have paid him half his fee already. The rest you will take with you and pay him when his job is done. He is trustworthy, unlike most. Papa trusts you, Miguel said. I'm ready to go. I said it with confidence, but I felt scared. Don Clemente was not making too much of the risks. Everyone had stories, bad stories, but I could not afford to wait. It was not getting easier to get across La Línea. It was getting harder every day. Domingo must be desperate. Domingo must be desperate to have you with him, Don Clemente continued. This is the first time he has asked for my help. I would have helped with your mother. I offered to send you too a long time ago and your sister. But Domingo was too proud to accept my help. I could not believe my ears. What was Don Clemente saying? All Papa had to do was ask and I could have gone to America just like that? I had waited and waited and waited just because Papa could not ask a rich old man for help? Don Clemente had money coming out of his ears. It especially hurt to know that it was Papa's pride that had kept us apart more than money. Orgullo, pure orgullo. Don Clemente handed me an envelope with a stack of bills inside. You know what I owe Domingo. This is a small payment on a large debt. It was true. Papa had pulled Don Clemente from a fire that burned down his house and killed his wife and daughter. Papa had saved him from the flames, but he could not save him from becoming bitter and angry. Money took the place of Don Clemente's family. They said he trafficked in everything. He could get anybody, anything he wanted or needed, anything at all. But Don Clemente's specialty was why most people ended up knocking on his gate, hat in hand. Everyone in the state knew him as the person who arranged the safest passage north 
for the biggest price. If you could scrape together his fees, you went with Don Clemente. They said he had never lost a single person. Nunca. Ni una persona. We could never afford Don Clemente's price. Whatever money Papa had sent, Don Clemente was making up the difference himself. I touched the edges of the bills in the envelope. Some of the money came from Papa's cutting lettuce and Ma Mama's picking strawberries. The rest of it came from Don Clemente. They say you're very quick. He looked at me curiously. Mija, Marisol was like you, smart, quicker than all the others. She would have gone far. He paused and rubbed the taut skin around his eye socket. Read the instructions carefully. Follow them exactly. My people will be expecting you. Gracias, Don Clemente, I replied. I will do as you say. I stood up and stuck out my hand. Don Clemente grasped it firmly in his. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Juanito emerge from the shadows at the edge of the patio. Don Clemente looked at his nephew, then pulled me into a hug. He was stronger than he looked. He held me for a second and then whispered his blessing into my ear. Que Dios te accompany. Chapter six. Abuelita poured more cafe into my half empty cup. The sweet scent of the canela that she boiled along with the coffee filled up the kitchen. We sat in friendly silence for many moments, watching the sun rise over the Sierra de las Angeles. We began most mornings that way, ever since Papa and Mama left years before. We never talked much. We did not need to. But the day after I saw Don Clemente, Abuelita had something on her mind. So did I. Por fin tu suplica, se te ha concedido, Abuelita finally said. I know how much this means to you. She reached across the table and entwined my fingers with hers. Dark brown age spots and deep blue veins covered the backs of her hands. A strand of gray hair fell out of the bun at the back of her head. She tucked it back behind her ear with her free hand while her other tightened its grip on mine. Abuelita, I began, I have a question for you. Please tell me the truth. I was sorry as soon as I said it. Abuelita would not lie. She just gave me a small smile and nodded. Is it true what Don Clemente told me about Papa? I swallowed hard. Si, mi hijo. Por qué, abuelita? Why, why? Miguel, your Papa must have had his reasons, she answered. You are going now, and that is what counts. I disengaged my hand from hers, stood up, and turned to the window. I know I want to go, but I do not know if I can forgive him. You are too hard on people, Miguel. You are hard on Elena. Abuelita answered, do not judge your father. I remained unmoving. I gripped the edge of the window sill tightly until my knuckles turned white. I could not talk back to Abuelita. No juzgues, mijo, she repeated firmly. It was as close as she ever came to scolding me, and it was the end of the conversation. We will need to slaughter a goat, she said. I want to have a going away party for you. No, Abuelita, I protested. Abuelita might need the goat meat later on. Things were tight, really tight with money. It seemed a waste to use it up and I did not want a party. I did not want any long goodbyes. I already had my eyes on La Lina. I could already feel my feet moving me away. But Abuelita was determined, so we set the fiesta for three days from then, the night before I was scheduled to leave. I spent the rest of the day poring over my travel packet. 
I memorized the routes and the names that Don Clemente had written to each in his flowing, elaborate handwriting. The sheaf of papers, the envelope with the money, all of it seemed too thin, too small to get me where I needed to go, so far north. But I followed Don Clemente's instructions to the letter. I went to the next town, to the supermercado, to buy the linens I needed a plastic water bottle, comfortable shoes, and a new backpack with compartments to store everything. I even got a pouch for the money to wear next to my skin under my shirt. I sneaked everything into the house when Elena was away and hid them in my secret place behind the wall. And then for the next three days, I did work for Abuelita that I should have done months ago. I hauled, chopped, and stacked a big pile of wood. I repaired several parts of the fence around the corral. I hit my thumb with the hammer twice and some of the boards hung a little crooked, but at least it was done. Then I climbed up on the roof to see if I could find the leaks. Even with the little rain we got last winter, Abuelita had to place pots under three places where steady drips of water fell into her kitchen. I patched the leaks. Poorly. Lo siento, Abuelita, I apologized to her silently as I worked. The truth was, I was no good as a carpenter. The patches on the roof probably would not last. Finally, I stood and stared at the tomatoes I had planted two months before. It was, I was an even worse farmer. Bugs had eaten most of them inside out, leaving gaping holes in the tomatoes. The tomatoes had escaped the bug attack, were small and shriveled. My chiles next to the tomatoes had puckered up and fallen off before they ripened. I picked one of Elena's tomatoes, growing right next to mine. It was round, red, and warm from the sun. I took a big bite. The juice ran down my chin, sweet as sugar. Elena's chiles had grown fat and shiny and long. I bet you can't grow ones as good as mine, Elena had taunted in the spring. I took her bet to shut her up. I checked my plants every day. I tried to do what Elena did with hers. I even gave them extra water, but it was useless. I could not compete. And that was not all. When Abuelita put me in charge of the animals last year, the cow quit giving milk and the goat dropped dead for no reason. Under Elena's care, the cow gave more milk than ever. Good thing. We needed the money we would get from selling it to Senor Gonzalez. Abuelita said I did not pay enough attention. She said my mind was always somewhere else. Anybody could grow a plant or raise an animal, but Abuelita did not scold. She did not even seem to blame me. To Abuelita, both my strengths and weaknesses were facts, as true as the rising sun or the drought that the sun caused. Fijate, she said last week. I hadn't latched the gate and three chickens disappeared. Elena is younger and already she can take care of the rancho better than you. There wasn't a bit of rancor in her voice. Abuelita was right and I did not care. Each failure I had on the rancho was just more proof to myself that my future lay across La Lina in California. If I had ever belonged in San Jacinto, I did not belong now.